when you give someone a good experience, it bodes well and supports that conversion through to the next stage. So one of the questions we ask the mystery shoppers is how likely they would be to continue. There is a resounding correlation between having a good experience and feeling likely that they would want to continue and the entirely the opposite. Those who had a negative experience, 93% of our mystery shoppers just said, absolutely no way, wouldn't go back, wouldn't care, just you've lost me already at that point. So definitely having a good experience is important for conversion. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of The Koala News, and I'm coming to you from Perth, Western Australia. G'day, and I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of The Global Society, coming to you from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And Dirk, something went wrong this week. There was no review. <laughs> no I review know. released. Incredible, hey? A fortnight without a review. Well, look, to explain it, the minister was in India and Indonesia, and Parliament was sitting this week. And not to mention the Prime Minister has been on the road as well to China and through the South Pacific. So it's it's all been happening. It has been happening, like very hot on the... I saw the minister was in India and Indonesia. So a lot going on globally in the past couple of weeks. What's been going on? Mate, this sure has. Let's start with the minister because there's been activity all over the globe this past fortnight. But we'll start with the minister. He took a delegation of 15 to India and the premise of it really... I guess it coincided with the first meeting of the Australia-India Education Skills Council where he co-chaired that with his Indian counterpart. But headlighting the trip was really, I guess, Deakin and Wollongong's expose into India. They're very, very close to being the first two foreign institutions to open up in India post the Foreign Universities Act being approved. So it's all go on the Australian education front in India. Interestingly enough, I guess Deakins announced that their first first two courses they're going to be teaching there, which is the Master of Business Analytics and the Master of Cybersecurity, they've actually set their fees. And I know that sounds a little bit trivial, but there's been a lot of people looking at, well, what's the price point going to be for an Australian institution that clearly has a large Indian population in Australia? What are you going to drop as your price point while you're teaching in India? And it's important too low and you're going to see a lot you might end up seeing indian students coming to australia being eroded too high and you may end up with a with a campus with no students so anyway the drum roll the fees set are 10 lakh indian rupees now one lakh is a hundred thousand so we're talking about a million indian rupees per year which turns out to be roughly 18,600 per year australian so considerably less than what you'd pay in australia and probably a little bit more than what you pay as an average in India. An astute commenter on my LinkedIn or on the Koala's LinkedIn pointed out that that doesn't take into account any sort of scholarship or discounting opportunities that may take in, uh, may may come about. So it's really quite interesting to see where that price point is. And I think there's going to be a lot of people around Australia taking very uh, a lot of notice of, of those fees. And it'll be interesting to see what happens to that fee regime over time. And if that is discounted, we, we know that student recruitment may be a little bit more difficult. If it holds where it is, then there's a really strong proposition there. What's your gut feeling on that? I look at that number and I sort of go, yeah, it kind of looks about right. Yeah, look, I, to be honest, I think it's probably going to be about a, a middle point. So it'll be interesting. Um, where they're setting up is actually in a, a called Gift City, and it's just outside, inside of, well, it's in Gujarat, just at a new Ahmedabad. So interestingly enough, will it attract students from across India to that site, or were you talking local students from Gujarat only? So a lot of these things are unanswered, and a lot of these are untested. The Indian government in the Foreign Universities Act, I think they're going to be looking at it very carefully too. It's a watch this space kind of thing, I think, Rob. I would love, you know, just as you were speaking, the people I'd love to pick the brains on there would be Kerry Ramirez and Dimity Huckle from Study Move, who do a lot of work on fees. Mm. I would be fascinated to know what they are thinking about that equation right there. But moving on, you've had Trevor Goddard writing similar sort of topic in the koala this week? Yeah, I have. So, look, the minister's trip wasn't just about Deakin and Wollongong. It wasn't just about the, the India Education and Skills Council meeting. There was a lot that happened on the sidelines. So he, the minister released the Partnership for the Future, Australia's Education Strategy for India. And that report contains three pillars to enhancing the long-standing educational partnership between India and Australia. These are delivering mutual benefit through education, strengthening institutional partnerships and research collaboration, and enhancing people-to-people links, mobility and employability. So it's probably the start of something that has been going for some time, but is probably a little bit more formalised now. It'll be interesting to see how that turns out. On the same token, there was an announcement of a three-year education funding extension 
in Gujarat for the Australia India Institute. That makes sense. Six members of the IRU have signed an MOU that will underpin the design of a new methodology for in-country delivery of Australian degrees in India. I find this one really fascinating because this is something the UK has been doing for a while and does quite well, where institutions come together to deliver degrees. So it'll be interesting to see the IRU model and to see how that pans out in India. Furthermore, Western Sydney University signalled its intent to open a campus in Bengaluru. And for those that aren't familiar with Bengaluru, that's Bangalore. And Monash University signed agreements with the IIT in Hyderabad and the International Centre of Excellence in Mining. So quite a bit happening on the sidelines of the minister's visit in India. And it wasn't just India that's been in the news, but Indonesia as well? Yeah, that's right. So Minister Clare went from India directly to Indonesia. Western Sydney University is the latest to announce a campus offering in, in Indonesia, in Surabaya. So there was a soft launch that took place in a hotel there, and that, I guess, on the back of Monash already having a, a fully-fledged campus and CQU teaching uh, in Indonesia, we'll now see WSU. 70 students anticipated to start in September 2024, and they'll work through that to, to a, a limit of about 2,500. And then there's a commitment, if once that's reached, to further build, which should accommodate 5,000 students. So it's not a small offering that, uh, that's going on in Indonesia with WSU. Obviously, the minister is actually the member for Blacksland, which is in, in Western Sydney. So... It was really interesting to see in his speech in Surabaya that he referred very much to Western Sydney being his home. And I guess his reflections on Western Sydney becoming to prominence while he was in his last year of high school. He went to, I believe, Canley Vale High and tracked across town uh, to UNSW at the time. So this is, it's a really interesting scenario where the boy from Western Sydney is promoting Western Sydney. Isn't that lovely? I love that. Oh, it really is. And coming from Western Sydney myself, it, it somewhat resonates. So I, I'm quite happy to see that. Awesome. Number of conferences on over the last couple of weeks. ISEF Berlin, the QS Higher Ed Conference was a big one, and then Navitas Partner Conference as well. Yeah, like I said earlier, there's been a lot of activity globally in the last fortnight. So yeah, ISEF Berlin, two and a half or almost two and a half thousand people speed dating. Could you imagine that for a speed dating event? It's a, it's a pretty big hotel in, in Berlin. One of the big announcements that came from that was actually interesting given our review period here in Australia. ISAF announced that it's expanding its IAS agency accreditation program and implementing a new code of conduct for education agencies. And I think this is a re it's a really interesting development given the fact that the government's looking at this space in a big way. So having a private player moving into the accreditation or ex I shouldn't say moving into, expanding their accreditation space is, a, I think, a really positive move. Probably going to be helpful in terms of that whole regulatory framework that we've been talking about over these last few news episodes. It's only going to become more important. So having a big player that's sort of taking charge hopefully speeds things up in some ways. Yeah, hopefully. It'd be interesting to see the government's view on industry regulating itself, if I can put it that way. I mean, certainly, if you look towards America, uh, there's a lot more private accreditation than government accreditation. I think we're probably a bit more socialised in that sense, and governments take on a more leading role in, in accrediting and ensuring quality assurance. It'll be an interesting move and to see what the government says. It's always the preferred model to be self-regulated rather than... Sure is. You mentioned QS, 1,300 in Kale. So again, conference is the back, baby, and we're seeing people travelling. It's great to see. On the back of that, Navit the Navitas Partner Conference was two weeks back. That was held in Bangkok. Special shout out to Curtin University, who took out Partner of the Year, and celebrations for Griffith and Deacon, who celebrate 25 years with Navitas. Wow. Uh, where's, that, where's that time gone? Where has that time gone? I remember the old IBT days well, and you know, Griffith and Deacon were, were pretty much first, up, first off the post past CCU. So it's good to see them lasting and enduring. And getting better. Awesome. And Navitas, also in the news, there was a sale that's come up in the last week. There sure was. Study Lit, the application to admission system, I guess had controlling interest in that. They offloaded that to Flywire, which is the accounts and payment system. They're based out of Boston in, in the US. Reported the net was 60 million Australian, not a, not a, a small amount. And we certainly hope that, that some of the, the, the bigger personalities within Study Link had, had some skin in the game in that transaction because that would put a big smile on their dial. Yeah, there have been some amazing international educators who are still at Study Link and who've been through Study Link over the past decade. I was super, super happy when this was announced. I think it was just earlier this week, about a week ago. Just so happy to see that announcement. I mean, Flywire is really taking off. But, but then to see this great organisation that's, that's made such a huge contribution being brought into a, in a larger framework, I thought was fantastic news. 
for Australian innovation in general, right? Not just international, oh, ab- but innovation absolutely. in general. Absolutely. Absolutely. It'll be, look, it'll be really interesting to see where Flywire takes it. It's, uh, you know, Stadelink's link has got a, a very good reputation, as you say, and it's, it's very engaged with a number of large players and small players across Australia. So to see where Flywire takes it will be interesting over the next couple of years. Yeah, well, kudos to Jason Howard and his team. A very nice guy, a very great bunch of people working for Study Link. Absolutely. So congratulations. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, to finish off, right, there's a kind of a feel-good story, if I can put it that way. I shouldn't say feel-good, but I say feel-good for the fact that it's not money-based, it's not recruitment-based. But the ANU put out a release last week, which Trevor Goddard picked up. They're leading a new consortium, building pathways for refugees to pursue higher education in Australia. Members of the consortium are Charles Sturt, Curtin, Deakin, Griffith, University of Canberra, University of Melbourne, University of South Australia, the University of Technology in Sydney, the University of Tasmania, and Victoria University. So just, a, I guess, a shout out to all of them to say this is good. They're obviously not going to do it for nothing, so the government will need to put it in their in their back pocket. But the Nationwide Alliance will work to co-design a blueprint for a proposed new groundbreaking education-led pathway for refugee resettlement in Australia. So I think it's probably well overdue, and congratulations to, to each of those institutions. All right, Rob, shall we bring in our guest? Let's do it. Our guest today is Alyssa Newell, who is a partner at Edified and is the head of the Inquiry Experience Tracker Project, which is a fascinating project. And results are out as of last month. Alyssa, welcome to Global Horizons. Thank you. Good to be here. Great to have you here, Alyssa. So tell us a little bit about the Inquiry Tracker Project. This is fascinating. I'm really looking forward to diving into the results of this project. Yeah, thank you. So this is a mystery shopping project that we run globally. It's in its third year. This year we had 128 institutions, mostly universities, but colleges, uh, Polytech's pathway colleges involved. There were 27 Australian and 10 New Zealand institutions. What we do is we have a team of mystery shoppers that international students, they go and place inquiries. We see what comes back and then we evaluate them and, and see who's giving the best service and where institutions can improve. And I've got to say, looking at the headline results, it looks like there's a fair bit of <laughs> a fair bit of work to improve in terms of the way that institutions can respond to those inquiries. The headline result that I really picked out, a global average of 51 out of 100 in terms of, I suppose, student satisfaction overall, but perhaps you can explain to people what that what that number 51 out of 100 means to begin with and how, how you arrive at that sort of number for an institution. Yeah, no worries. So it is out of 100. It's broken down into a couple of different criteria. And so sometimes institutions can do well in one criteria and poorly in the other, and it you know gives them an average score. But we look at the inquiry channels, how, what kind of channels are you offering? How easy are they to find on the website? We look at how fast institutions are to reply to the inquiries placed to them. We look at the quality of the actual communications. You know, is it clear? Is it persuasive? Is it tailored? Is it relevant? How, you know, how good is it? We also look at what they do after they've answered the question. Do they follow up with the student and kind of lead them on to the next step or don't they? And that was really what we found. They, they don't a lot of the time. And the final criteria is one that the mystery shoppers, who are international students themselves, they we ask them to rate the, their sentiment, like how they feel about it and how likely they would be, you know, if they're really considering that institution to actually take the next step. So it's all those things put together that um, make up the, the final score. And you're right, an average of 51 out of 100. It's actually the same as last year. I was kind of surprised that nothing much has changed. But, I mean, an average is an average, and in our report you can sort of see the individual scores and the the range of them. And actually there's some institutions doing really great. I mean, AUT was best in the world over in New Zealand. They got a score of 81 out of 100, so they're pretty much nailing every criteria. Six of the top ten were from Australia and New Zealand, so I could probably safely say we're leading the world. And, the you know, two-thirds of the Australian institutions are sitting above world average. So the average number is a global number and it's a bit of a difference between what what you think is is happening here in ANZ and what might be happening in the UK versus Canada, Europe, Middle East, other parts. And that's probably the interesting um, thing that we find when we look at the results. Yeah, it's funny you say that, Alyssa. I think back to when I was within an institution and I think international students mainly engage with institutions via the website via EDMs that uh, the universities would send out and via telephones. 
this report seems to indicate that students are now engaging with institutions via a multitude of channels now. And one of the interesting uh, stats that comes out of this, and I hate to jump straight into the negative, but what, only one in five had a positive experience via Facebook or Instagram. That astounds me. And I just wonder, and I, I th again, think back to when I was in the institution, is that because Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts are generally controlled by central marketing as opposed to international offices or international outreach people? And therefore, we've got to start thinking about functional alignment of some of these things as we move forward, because we're now seeing that, that these are bona fide channels now. Yeah, you're spot on. That's my hunch too. I'll just go flip it to the positive. So the positive is that institutions are generally doing fairly well, like consistently getting good scores in things like email and inquiry form. So we're very familiar with that. We're used to dealing with that. We're doing it for years. That that sort of stuff has always sat with recruiters and um, you know the people who are student facing. Social media has often been in the realm of those managing the the brand or the corporate kind of comms um, it might be sitting in a separate team and I, institutions, yeah, all the ones that I've worked at have had separate systems. It's not feeding into the CRM. And what our mystery shoppers found, not all, but, you know, the, the times where it was bad, which was <laughs> quite a chunk of the times, they, they found they were often brushed off. So they either didn't get a reply or when they got a reply, it was someone coming back to say, thanks for your inquiry. Can you please email blah, blah, blah. And it's like, Sorry, yeah, as an institution, you're out there, you're putting all this great stuff on social media, you're trying to create this impression that we're great, we're welcoming, all of that. And then as soon as someone actually responds to that and is coming to you through the, a channel that you're offering, a channel of their preference and their choice, you're putting the hand up and saying, oh, go over there. I really think that is something that needs to be looked at and it's it's not good customer service to kind of be forcing the customer to, to do things on your terms rather than theirs. It kind of reminds me back in the day when over the Christmas holidays, we used to have people calling in and they'd get an answering machine and somebody would have to call them back. This is before inquiry management services came about. And it's almost like a bit of a dead end, I guess, or a, certainly a, a junction point in that relationship where you're making the customer or the client or the student do more than what they really need to. So it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating point. Yeah, I was fascinated to see how when, when you break down, so the report breaks down these different categories, the different criteria that you use to assess institutions. So an eight out of 10 as an average in terms of the diversity of channels available to students. Fantastic. Students have plenty of channels, but then pretty much every region of the world rated as poor across the board in terms of follow-up. And, and then if you dive a bit deeper into the details, one of the things I pulled out was the fact that only two-thirds, I mean, two-thirds is good, but only two-thirds actually use marketing automation. I, I was quite stunned by that. I would have thought that that would just be 99% of institutions would obviously have marketing automation in place to be doing the basics of you're a digital marketer by marketer by background, aren't you? So yeah, that result must stun you when you see something like that. Oh, yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no, because it's actually harder than it sounds. A lot of institutions might have the technology but not be using it or they're only using it a little bit, maybe for one page, one track, one segment, one something, and they're not using it broadly so the number uh, the, that percentage that you just quoted that's actually gone up since last year so last year was less people than that were saying they had marketing automation and there were more that were in the camp of saying we're looking at it you know we're, we, it's on our to-do list kind of thing so I think it's positive people are uh, more and more have that that capability again if I just dived into the Australian and New Zealand contingent you'll find it's almost everyone has it and you're looking in in Canada, it's almost nobody is operating in that space. So it's a very different, not just tech, technology kind of capability, but just way of thinking about, well, we, we would use the word inquiry management, but we actually mean lead management or, you know, prospect engagement. Whereas I think in some places it is literally inquiry handling, tick, file away. You know, it's not about, it's not got a connection into that kind of sales or recruitment activity. If I can, I might lead on to the next point that I picked up on because I think it, it flows quite well. Institutions communicate factual information well, but struggle to persuade 70%. That's amazing. Yes. So 70% do not have any kind of persuasive content in their comms. So, you know, there's a thousand odd pieces of comms that we analysed and that's an awful lot that are really 
sitting there, oh, the student asked me the fee, here's the fee, goodbye. You know, the students asked for uh, the admission requirement, here's the admission requirement, goodbye. I kind of liken it to, you know, if you were a if you're a recruiter and you go to an event and a student walks up to your table and says, oh, can you tell me the you know, requirement for this? There is no way, no how that they're just going to get that kind of dead end kind of response. They're going to be invited to sit down and I'm going to use that opportunity to try and tell you all the great things about my institution, my city, my whatever. But it's just not happening via, via email or other comms. And Part of it, I think, is because we have different teams. So often people are coming into those kind of inquiry roles with an administrative background and it's very task focused. You know, I've got to get my inbox down, you know, by the end of the day and the templates are kind of written up, copy, paste, copy, paste, send, send, send. But those who do it really well and you kind of look at the 30%, they're saying, hang on while I've got you, you might also like to know about how great our campus is take a look at this fabulous video. Or by the way, our, our business faculty runs nightly, weekly sessions for postgrad students. You should come along and meet some of the others who are uh, thinking about studying here too, like who can just weave that stuff in. Or even some just have a very, it doesn't have to be super kind of sophisticated. Some institutions just have a really nice, it's probably a blank blanket kind of statement that they just put at the beginning of everything. Yeah, thanks for your inquiry of studying here. Did you know we're one of the best at blah and blah? Now let me answer your inquiry. Just something, anything that makes you stand out. Yeah. Like you say, it's moving away from that transaction and creating a relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And the story. And the story. I mean, I obsess about stories and I really feel that that's the difference between good and great. Like good is answering the question. That's fulfilling the minimum that is required from that inquiry and from that interaction with a student. And great is when you enchant them in some way, you know, you provide context or extra value. And that's the story we tell. Social media is obviously one part of, part of that and other sorts of content. But yeah, approachability, engagement, the way you write emails is all critical to this. That's it. And tone. I mean, I just, it's a really, you think it's a small thing, but it, when you can feel something through the written, you know, word and you can feel welcomed or you can feel that you've actually annoyed the person by asking a question, there's a very big difference. And I still remember one day, like we, even we get auto, you know, we analyze the auto replies that come back to, to acknowledge emails. And, and one said something about blah, blah, blah. It's a high volume of inquiries. I will deal with your inquiry when I can. It was just exactly that. I'll deal with you. You're someone I have to deal with. Not nothing that made the student feel welcome. Like these little choices of words. And if you're someone who's coming from halfway around the world, you're giving up all your safety and security of your family and friends, you don't want to be going to a place where people think they're just dealing with you. You know, you want to be felt like you're actually going to be at home and welcomed and appreciated there. Reminds me of dealing with a bank. Yeah, I deal with my bank, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So what, in terms of general recommendations, obviously every institution being, being different and having its specific set. And I imagine institutions that participate in this probably get an individualized report yeah. and recommendations. But across the board, what would be your broad observations of the, the easy wins that institutions could be having to improve their inquiry experience? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that you kind of touched on some of the things in, in our conversation already, having that conversation with the social media team and just figuring out what, what goes on there so that we're bringing that channel into view and even training those people up or referring inquiries to the teams who do know, something like that. Another one is really around, it probably does come down to staff training, but it's answering all the questions that a student has asked, not sort of trying to give a general answer or sending one someone to a general web page. If they've asked a specific question, make that person's job easy and actually give them the answer that they that they need. I did see that, 50, only 50%. Only 50% of questions yeah. were answered, which is which is yeah. a crazy stat, isn't it? That's right. I mean, we had one of the inquiries was about a, a kind of like scenarios that we inquired about. We had a, a student who is a US student. They specifically asked, I'd like to do this course. Can I pay for that through my Stafford loan? And the number of institutions who wrote back and say, here's our page on fees and funding. And you look at that page and there's nothing very clear on that that mentions. So what is the student meant to do? You know, if, if there's a 
a reason why people ask questions and it may need more training for those teams and making sure that if it's a central inquiry team and maybe the international office is separate, make sure they're up to date on on what the kind of realities are and key questions are in different markets. So yeah, that's definitely part of it. Follow-up is really important. So depending on the institution, it might be that you're not capturing consent, you know, even getting the permission from students to be doing email marketing or other kinds of follow-up. So if you haven't got that in place, uh, do that. Um, if you are capturing consent and you're just not following up, it might be around connecting up systems or data or putting something in place that's manual, just a, a single follow-up. Or if you do have it all going into a system, like thinking about the timing of those so that it's timely within a week or two of having having responded to the student and that it's going to be relevant, that they're not just getting every single thing you're spamming out there, but the things that kind of relate to their course, their country, their interests. That's some top tips from me. It's heading that way, isn't it? It's like content is one thing. I think a few years ago, content was a game. You had great content, then that was already an enormous advantage. But now context is becoming so critical because great content is everywhere, like literally everywhere all the time. Yeah. It's a personalization and, and really having the data behind the scenes to be able to map your tag, the content, tag the person and have it mapped together automatically. Yeah. Fascinating conversation. I guess to conclude, the impact of all of this work, where does that figure in terms of, of I guess, institutions engaging with it? But also just, I guess, from a very top level, how do you see that affecting the relationship between institutions and students? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. Research is great. You know, doing activity on its own is, is it's, it needs to actually tie to your strategy and what you're trying to achieve. And what institutions are trying to achieve is to recruit students and to to do so as efficiently as as possible. There are a lot of inquiries that come in, and a lot of them are not going to be from people who are suitable to your institution. So there needs to be a process of you know, figuring out and and filtering those. But when you give someone a good experience, it bodes well and supports that conversion through to the next stage. So one of the questions we ask the mystery shoppers is how likely they would be to continue. There is a resounding correlation between having a good experience and feeling likely that they would want to continue and entirely the opposite. Those who had a negative experience, 93% of our mystery shoppers just said, absolutely no way, wouldn't go back, wouldn't care, just you've lost me already at that point. So definitely having a good experience is important for conversion. But one of the interesting points, so we have done some work with UniQuest in the UK in, in kind of pulling together the design of the study every year. They report like manage millions of student journeys on behalf of UK unis. And what they've found is that students who inquire before they apply, they're actually twice as likely to convert to an enrolment as someone who doesn't inquire before they apply. I mean, obviously that makes sense. They're much more invested, but it, I just think institutions should keep that in mind every time they speak to someone who's inquiring. Like, it can make a difference and it does. Where can people get a copy of this uh, summary report, Alyssa? Well, you can go onto the Edified website, edified.com.au. There's a little page for the inquiry experience tracker and it's a few links and things on there. This is one of those pieces of work that, you know, three years in, I, I just can't wait to see how it evolves over the next five years. You know, it just gets disproportionately more valuable the longer the time series is that we have behind this sort of thing. So if institutions want to sign up and, and get involved, where where do they do so? That'd be great. I mean, we are looking, the more institutions that are part of it, the bigger the sample, the better the benchmarking and insights that we can share with everyone. So again, yeah, head over to the Edified website. There's lots of different options and you can fill out the form and sign up there. And I guess that benefit is sooner you do it, then you can have that year on year data and keep tracking how you're going. Alyssa, before we go, the Edified Energizer Grants. Um, I know that they're closing shortly, uh, maybe even today, but what a fabulous initiative in terms of being able to support idea creation within the industry. Can you tell us just a little bit about those and why people may not be able to apply? Um, some of the types of, I guess, examples that you've seen in the past um, and whether you're planning on running them again next year? Yeah, this is an annual thing from Edified's point of view. We put up a, a series of grants that are for um, students and alumni to of anyone who's really got an idea of how they can support and, and further education in their community. 
So, I mean, examples before have been things like remote communities in the Philippines, you know, supplying laptops to do remote study centres or feminine hygiene in schools in Africa to empower more, you know, girls to go to school. Lots of different things. It, it doesn't have to be kind of on that uh, development level. We've got um, grants related to you know, equity and First Nations. We've got grants related to experiential learning, employability. I mean, we're, we work with Successful Graduate, TAP, Lead 5050 and Go and Connect to put the grants together. So we give $5,000 grants a year. Probably by the time this podcast has dropped, the, the winners will be pretty close to being announced and so there'll be some fanfare on social media and you can read about all the great initiatives going on out there. Fantastic. Make sure the koala gets a heads up on the winners. Okay, will do. You will be able to read all of the winners' names in the koala news and for all the latest news in international education for Australia, thekoalanews.com is your source of information. Alyssa, thanks for joining us on Global Horizons. Fantastic to have you here. And Dirk, as always, a pleasure to have you on board, mate. And thanks again for keeping us up to date with all of the news. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Alyssa. See you next time. Thanks, guys. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time-consuming and complex, so if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.